Uh, with that, uh, uh, good evening, Scott. How are you doing? Doing well. How about you, Len? Great. Uh, good to see you again. It, uh, uh, we go back quite a ways. Um, uh, I have always been impressed with, uh, with uh, you and Gary. You're, you're uh, two of the most uh, aggressive and, and uh, history-interested people I've ever met in my life. And uh, the, the body of y'all's work is, is very, very impressive. I've always been impressed by how well prepared you all are for the programs that you do and the programs that you work together. Um, let's start off with just uh, tell people just a little something about who you are and um, how'd you get interested in all this and why are you specifically interested in the uh, uh, Saratoga campaign? Well, you know, I've been interested in military history all of my life. Um, you know, my, my, my dad, used to, he was a boy growing up in World War II in Pennsylvania and used to tell me stories that he heard as a young boy from the veterans who had come home and things. And I just kind of always did. And, and, and I really gravitated. You know, they took me to places, and historic places, and, uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, mostly, you know, frontier and Revolutionary War, colonial stuff. And, um, but then, um, you know, and after I graduated from high school, we moved down to Virginia, you know, the heart of the Civil War. So, you know, it was right there in my backyard when I was going to college, sure. got into that. And, um, you know, as um, Gary and I, we got into doing a lot of touring over the last 25 years, um, you know, we just, love to go out and explore these places, research them, and, 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 and share these things that fascinate us so much with other people. Um, it, it, it's, um, I, I enjoy going, being out on a battlefield or at a historic site discussing things more than I do writing articles and books. I, that, that's like, I, I like doing it. Um, I really like the, um, you know, the, the van size tours that B just does because because um, I, I think one of the things is gives you an opportunity to meet the people a bit more and you get to develop some relationships over the week or weekends that you spend with people. So it's just, um, you know, and, and it's just here. Now, Saratoga came about um, the first time probably 20, 25 years ago going there. Yeah, I was on a visit with a friend of mine. Um, um, and God, we drove up one night after work and stayed about a couple hours south of there. And we were up there at the crack of dawn. And it's just one of the most beautiful sights. We were at the point of the British artillery area and you're on a bluff overlooking the Hudson River with the mountains off to the east. Uh, sun coming up is one of the most beautiful sights. So this this whole campaign here, um, really, if people if you haven't been there before, um, the the scenic and natural beauty of this, um, just pretty much every place that you go is impressive. Um, so set aside the fact that you know we're all interested in the history and the epic events that occurred there in the late summer and early fall of 1777 um you're doing this in this setting that's just a wonderful place um you know where it's just you're standing on saratoga battlefield or um hubbardson battlefield or at fort ticonderoga or on the shores of lake champlain and you just find yourself staring off at the scenic beauty uh, of the nature of the area there. So, and, and for me to put the two together, um, this is, I, I think one of the top places to take people because A, the combination of the epic history, um, the myriad stories and subplots that come out out of Burgoyne's campaign in, in that setting. Um, I think it's a real mix and, you know, I'm just, I'm really praying and crossing my fingers that, you know, we, we get the green light and are able to, you know, be open for business when this one comes around in June. Cause I think the folks, you're all really enjoy this. Uh, Scott, let's, let's focus on the revolutionary war. Cause it's so easy to drift into other things. Uh, uh, 
tell us how uh, Burgoyne's campaign uh, fits into the overall uh, situation in 1777. Well, you know, knowing that, you know, we got a group that's predominantly does civil war tours, I'll give you a little background. So, you know, July 4th, 1776, 1776 Declaration of Independence. But you know what? More than a year before that, we had a lot of action going on up in a place called Boston, you know, Lexington, Concord, um, the siege of Boston, where George Washington successfully forced the British to abandon Washington and sail off to Nova Scotia, um, only to have them, you know, return a few, in 1776, to have them return and attack and rout Washington's army in the campaign for New York. It ends up driving Washington across the state of New Jersey. And it's a really period of demoralization, the summer and fall of 1776, after all the excitement um, that had precursed it with the Declaration of Independence is, is General Howe and his successful campaign captures New York. And Washington, you know, He's kind of going to, in, in late, he's going to launch the end of 76 and early 77, Princeton and Trenton, the surprise attacks and the victories there. That those, They're smaller battles compared to the ones he had lost in New York, but they're very important to maintain morale and momentum and, and keep the Patriot cause together. So, so Washington's very successful about that. Um, and coming into 1777, now we've got British. Um, and we're going to have two campaigns here coming in there. And, you know, so we have Washington in the summer of 1777 is, is kind of up in New Jersey, monitoring the, the British that summer who are, you know, headquartered out of New York City. And you know, he's seeing plainly from his viewpoint that there's some sort of major effort being made. And what's happening down there is that um, Howe, General Howe's getting ready to go on a massive, um, he's putting his troops on the ships and he's gonna head out to sea just far enough to move beyond the horizon so that the Continental Scouts can't necessarily tell where they're going. But then they're gonna head south to the Chesapeake Bay and they're gonna launch the campaign, the Philadelphia campaign um, in 1777, it will culminate with the Battle of Brandywine and ultimately the British capture of Philadelphia. Now, Burgoyne's campaign that we're talking about is going to start in June of 77, and it's going to culminate in October of 1777. So these things are going on there at the same time. Here, so you have Washington. So, I, we'll, you know, it's one of the things that we go on this tour, and I, some of you may have gone with Gary and I a couple of years ago when we did the Philadelphia campaign with Washington versus Howe there, and how that campaign came out. So, there's a lot going on together at this. It's it's fascinating. You mentioned. Um... Or for those who are interested, it, it, such as the circumstance were because of the COVID last year, it's, it's kind of packed some things in. So not only are we doing this, but you guys are doing Trent and Princeton later on in this series and also this year. And I'm doing Boston, Lexington and Concord uh, at the same time. So for folks who would like to get a real immersion in the Revolutionary uh, War, you're going to be able to get Lexington, Concord, Boston, Trent and Princeton and um, uh, uh, the Saratoga campaign all in one year. So uh, I think kind of this unique for us, we don't normally do three Revolutionary War programs in a year. Um, having said that, um, when Burgoyne comes, I, I, I've always found Burgoyne interesting. As a matter of fact, I've, I've got uh, uh, Doug Covison's book. He, he edited the letters of, of Burgoyne and so forth in the campaign. And, and what I was wondering, um, I haven't had a chance to read through that yet. I've just glanced at it. But what expectations did Burgoyne have in undertaking a campaign in the Hudson Valley? Well, first of all, this is a multi-pronged campaign. And one of the things, though, you got to keep in mind is that um, Howe is commanding his army, and he's reporting to Lord Germain 
in London, and Germain reports to King George. And um, Burgoyne, he reports to Carleton. He's, uh, he's coming out of Canada, and Governor Carleton in Canada. So, and Burgoyne gets his orders directly from Carleton, excuse me, from Germain as well. And as a result of the plans initially that um, Burgoyne had put together, he's going to be expecting, and so if you take a look at this map, uh, kind of a three-pronged offensive toward Albany. Um, Albany's off the map there. And um, what's, what's important to know about, no, it's not, it's just to the bottom, at the bottom of the map, bottom right, yeah. Albany. Um, and so he's expecting, he's got his main army of 8,000 men, which started up in the Montreal area and is going to move south. And he's expecting that while he's moving southward, um, he knows he has about two to 3,000 um, men, some regulars, but mostly um, under Barry St. Leger, um, moving up the Mohawk Valley, coming off from the left-hand side of the map. One of the key things that he was expecting was that Howe would detach forces from New York City and move up the Hudson River from the south. Well, Howe's campaign is getting, has its approval, um, you know, and, and, and Howe is going to move off from New York um, in, in July, mid to late July. And it's going to be about the time that um, he's getting messages from Burgoyne. They've captured Fort Ticonderoga. They're moving southward. And um, there, some of like some of the expectations of Germain here where it becomes impractical. And Germain actually at one point never gave direct orders to Howe to send troops northward to support Burgoyne's effort. Um, so, and, and there's a lot of controversy around that. At one point, um, Burgoyne, excuse me, Howe was supposed to go capture Philadelphia and then be back in New York in time to send troops northward toward Albany in the fall. So none of that's really practical. And, when, and so Germain can't be managing two campaigns uh, from across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, if you think Lincoln had trouble and Jefferson Davis had trouble, you know, getting their commands and their wishes carried out by their generals where they had telegraphs. You know, you t took you six weeks to get something back and forth um, across the pond in that day. So once these things get underway, everybody's kind of on their own hook and there'll be no meaningful support coming out of New York City to support this campaign. Now, another area where Burgoyne had expectations that turned out to be unfulfilled was that this area had been purported from loyalists. That, hey, there's a lot of loyalists in this area. They're going to they're gonna flock to your ranks as you move farther south up the Hudson Valley toward Albany. Well, the truth was there were sizable numbers of loyalists. And I say loyalists, sometimes, you know, you have these words and well, George Washington was loyal to his cause and Howe was loyal to his. But when I say a loyalist, I'm referring to a residents of the colonies, now states, um, who were chose not to rebel. They remained in support of King George and the Great Britain. So when they come down here, they realize most of your, your harder core loyalists they went north to Canada fairly early on during the Revolutionary War, and they've already enlisted and are in the ranks of the British forces. Those who remain at their homes and on their farms in this region are more, they're not going to show their hand. They're not going to show themselves publicly to be loyalists until they know for certain that British control has been firmly established into the area. Because They've seen and they've heard stories about what happens to loyalists when the revolutionaries are running the show. And they know that the revolutionaries are dominant in this region at the time. So they need to see success from the British Army before they're going to come out and rejoice and be public with their support. Um, another, I'm going to go beyond just the two a little bit, but another thing is 
Burgoyne also expected to be able to kind of live off the land here. And I'll talk about that a little later, but um, that will not work out for him as well. So those are three very important factors that had gone into the planning of this campaign that in the end did not come to fruition for gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. I might add the, the latest research actually states um, that it that probably wasn't a nickname that was around at any time while he was alive or till like the late 1800s, early 1900s, one historian is, his research is showing. Well, yeah, of course, uh, Burgoyne was not a titled uh, favored man in, in the court of, of the King of King George III. And so uh, consequently he didn't, he, he was only a gentleman so that's how he became Gentleman Johnny, whereas the other generals uh, of the, of the uh, British Army had all been knighted and were all Sir, Sir Richard Howe, Sir, Sir William Howe, and, and so forth. Um, you know, somebody else who has been overlooked but is really a significant, feat, uh, significant player in this campaign and in an early American history is uh, Philip Schuyler. Tell us a little something about him. Yeah. Yeah. I find Schuyler to be one of these really interesting guys, Len. It, um, you know, he kind of was going back. They had Horatio Gates up in this department earlier on running it. And then they went back to Schuyler. And at one point earlier in 1777, Schuyler actually visits Washington and Washington kind of makes it up. They say Schuyler's in charge up there. Now, Schuyler is actually doing a tremendous job with the limited resources that he's initially going to have at his disposal um, as um, Burgoyne is heading south up, you know, first Lake Champagne and then down the east of Lake George and then heading down towards the Saratoga region. Um, and what he's going to do is, you know, once, but unfortunately, his downfall is going to be when Fort Ticonderoga falls, um, he's going to take the blame for that. Never mind that it, it was an untenable position and with, with the troops that they had there. They had insufficient troops available to man it. Um, another guy, poor guy, poor Arthur Sinclair, he gets sent out there you know, about a week or so before Burgoyne arrives and basically he has to come in and, and plan the withdrawal of Fort Ticonderoga. And um, so both of these men's careers will be tarnished by the fall of Fort Ticonderoga in July of 1777. But after that, as the British are moving south, there's a lot of this is a heavily wooded area between Fort Ticonderoga and what you see marked as Saratoga on the map. Saratoga is today known as Stillwater, New York. So it's been renamed. And um, there's Saratoga Spring somewhat to the east of there with the racetrack and Saratoga Battlefield is down to the south where you'll see Bemis Heights on, on the map that's up there. So um, what he does is he sends parties out into these wooded areas. They're chopping down trees. They're flooding roads, they're creating bogs, swamps. A lot of this region is already swampy as it is. It is going to significantly delay gentleman Johnny Burgoyne as he's moving south. Because what's he got to do? He eventually has to send out a significant corps of troops to um, remove the obstructions, build causeways over these swamps, drain the flooded areas that Schuyler's men had created that slows down progress. What happens as his army slows down? Well, the men still gotta eat, whether they're moving or not. They're burning supplies and they're finding, um, and this is largely because of Schuyler's efforts. Schuyler's having all the farmers in the area drive off their cattle out of the regions, just haul off as much as they could so that the British could not live off the land. So it wasn't necessarily that it wasn't available, Schuyler made sure that those resources would not be there as his army falls back. Um, so I just think he's um, kind of a, he's really sets, he's setting the stage for victory. But ultimately, Continental Congress, after they get word of the fall of Fort Ticonderoga, 
they decide to relieve him of command and they're going to send Gates back to upstate New York and place Horatio Gates um, in command of the Continental Army that is going to be fight the battle of Saratoga. He'll arrive in August. You mentioned Gates, um, uh, certainly one of the most um, uh, checkered records of, of the revolution, uh, and yet a very fascinating and interesting character. Um, uh, tell me, uh, what are your opinions about uh, Gates and his uh, role in the campaign's place in history? Well, you know, you talk a little about Gates in here. You can't, talking about Gates, you got to talk a little bit about Benedict Arnold at the same time. Um, one of the things, you know, doing a lot of the reading of the latest scholarship and things that's out there is um, there's this depiction of Gates as a very detached commander, um, incompetent. I think there's some of the historiography, history that comes out on him. And then you have um, Benedict Arnold, who later becomes the traitor. And so, and, and Gates, Gates is the anti-Washington. Anytime there's a faction, boy, we don't know if Washington's the guy. The next obvious guy in line that anybody might think of to replace Washington would have been Gates. Gates was a British regular. He came over to the um, colonies during the French and Indian War. Very interesting. Him in Washington, a number of other notables, including Daniel Morgan, who's part of this campaign, they're all going to be under Edward Braddock and Braddock's ill-fated expedition in 1775 to capture Fort um, Duquesne, what's now Pittsburgh from the French that was basically annihilated instead. In fact, you know, there were some fears and things as Burgoyne's moving south and gets down there, they, they started to, there, there was some comments that, hey, this could turn into like Braddock's expedition there. That was in, in a lot of some of the early criticism, but you think about it, moving southward into this heavy wilderness, such a large army with a heavy artillery train. But anyway, so Gates did, knows a lot of these guys. There's a lot of connections there. And, and he is a solid experienced military man and, and he does believe in the Patriot cause. Um, you know, he, he will, he's not, what I would call you, the more I read about him, an incompetent general. Um, you know, so I, I, just, I just think that's one of the things when you get out there on the field and we talk about, okay, because in some ways, both Gates and Benedict Arnold, it's okay to always criticize these guys and throw out wild things throughout history about them because uh, the anti-Washington and the traitor, you know, was, and early on in some of the early histories, nobody was checking that stuff. Everybody was like, oh yeah, Gates, yeah, you know, and Benedict Arnold, the traitor and things there. Let's, let's, let's uh, pivot to Arnold. Um, uh, you know, never, never a man in American history ever got, uh, uh, higher marquee marks than Benedict Arnold. I mean, it, you, we don't have time. We could just talk just strictly about Arnold in this hour, uh, up, back, forth, and everything else. I remember several years ago, I was in London and was uh, riding out of town on uh, a main road, and there was a there was sign on the side of things that Benedict Arnold lived here after yeah. after the war. You going back to England <laughs> and so forth, and. And um, it was interesting because I also had gone to Westminster Abbey at the time and had seen where uh, Major Andre was buried as a place of honor in the Abbey. And um, uh, having read a number of books about Arnold, it just strikes me that um, uh, he certainly is one of the most fascinating characters in American history. And I'd like you to focus, though, because I think certainly Saratoga is perhaps his high watermark as a. Um, as a continental officer and all other things aside, let's just focus on Arnold's role at Saratoga. Arnold's going to first come up there. You know, Arnold has already been in, he's, he's always resigning. He, he always feels that he's getting the short, short end of the stick there and that 
Um, he didn't get his major general's promotion fast enough. Therefore, five guys um, had got promoted and had seniority over him. Um, he was getting ready to resign again, threatening to resign in July of 1777. And remember, he's, he's like the commandant down at Philadelphia. Excuse me, no, and, and he is um, sent up. Washington sends him up, not, not with a command, but to go up and to help Schuyler. And Schuyler's going to give him a brigade and some other troops. And it's at this point, um, Barry St. Leisure's troops, they're, they're laying siege to Fort Stanwix in what's now Rome, New York, and the Battle of Oriskany is developing in early August. Benedict Arnold's leading a relief force coming in from the east. Now, it turns out they're, they're pushing the British away and the Indians away at that point in, in stopping St. Ledger's um, eastward advance up the Mohawk Valley towards Albany. But it, it was critical, though, knowing that those reinforcements were coming in there. So he's right away, he was entrusted by Schuyler. He was recognized as a capable guy. And I think one of the things about Benedict Arnold that there is to like about him that ironically I would say, but be very American as opposed to how the British did business was he was a man of action. Um, you know, you see that at Valcor Island, um, probably, you know, they call it the strategic victory in that. Some of that's probably overstated and things like that, but still nevertheless, you can't take away from Benedict Arnold what he does and how he takes action. He, he, he doesn't like to see opportunities slip away. And on the, at the first battle of Saratoga on the 19th of September, this is now Gates is in command. He is in command of the left wing of the army. And that battle starts, the British start swinging around and engaging in um, it's a back and forth battle. And Arnold was calling for reinforcements and Gates, Gates didn't think the time was right and he held, held, held back. Um, and afterwards, the two men would have an altercation. Now, popular in a lot of the traditional interpretations of the Battle of Saratoga tell you that um, he's relieved of command, but he hangs around the camp spewing negativity and doom and gloom and undermining Horatio Gates as the commander of that army. And yeah. that he flies out into the midst of the battle without any formal role on the second battle in early October and just starts hijacking troops and taking command and launching attacks. The truth is they would worked it out. He remains in command. He's a formal commander at that final battle when he's out there. Um, nevertheless, it, it, it is heroic. And, you know, especially you get out there. And I, I know one of the things I always like to do on battlefields is, you know, you know, the Park Service lots of times has trails. Those trails don't necessarily take you on the course of the action. So that's I go out and I plan, how, how can we walk this here and have people follow the course of action for parts of the battle so you can feel that. And when you, you know, it's one called the bloody redoubt where the continental troops will overrun it, but then they're taking fire there and it's really incredible. And it's at that point where that part of the battle starts getting bogged down that Benedict Arnold starts leading troops off to the far Western or left flank, getting around. And that's going to be the key to victory for the Arnold led by Ben for the army led by Benedict Arnold. Arnold will be wounded in the leg there, and seriously wounded um, and incapacitated for an extensive period of time. Now, as he's, you know, with subsequent events, one of the most interesting monuments to a battlefield commander that you'll ever see. Um, the spot where he is wounded is marked by a stone boot monument. Um, and they don't mention his name, they don't say what he did. You know, they just have the boot there marking the spot where he was wounded as the troops were overrunning that final British position there at the Battle of Saratoga. Um, he, would get, um, he wouldn't get an outright promotion, but Washington made sure then that his rank um, equaled or predated those five men who were got promoted ahead of him at the time he was originally passed over. 
And of course, we all know how the Benedict Arnold story ends from that time going forward. But it's um, it's that's what a lot of people, you know, we learn about him generally in history in the phrase, oh, he's a real Benedict Arnold. You know, we, we learn those kind of things in school yeah. history and things, but we don't understand, you know, what a dynamo this man was leading the American forces in assaults against the British army. And then a couple of years later, he's switching sides. And yeah, it I, th- all comes I think out of that bruised ego and feeling that he's always feeling underappreciated and not getting the recognition that was due him. Yeah. Such a complex character. It's such a complex period of time. And I mean, you know, not even time to go into all the bits and pieces there, but, but you look at him and he certainly was a man that uh, I think perhaps outside Nathaniel Green, uh, there was nobody that Washington had more confidence in. And, you know, speaking about Washington, um, you know, this, this is the campaign that uh, is the decisive campaign, I think, of the Revolutionary War. Washington's not physically there. What's but 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 he has got a plan and he is working in support. What's what's Washington doing at this time and how does he affect this campaign? Well, remember, he's he's as this campaign's developing. He's watching Howe sail away from New York with this massive flotilla and a massive army. So he knows something's coming somewhere and he's trying to figure that out. But, you know, so he's getting the reports about Burgoyne's progress. And I think this shows uh, and we all know the stories of how many generals in wars, you know, they never want to, um, uh, you know, generals never want to give away troops and resources to another general. But here's where Washington, the genius and the selflessness of him, although he's got Howe's army that's soon going to be coming up the Chesapeake Bay. He, he's not sure where, but he knows he's going to something's going on there and he's going to be sending troops. First, you know, Benedict Arnold, who he knows to be a capable combat leader, up to assist Schuyler. And then he's going to take away some of the best shot troops in the Continental Army, Daniel Morgan's riflemen. These are the guys that made that lightning quick march from Winchester, Virginia, up to Boston in 1775, just because they wanted to make sure they were going to get in on it. And they, as marksmen, and they are going to play a key role. And we do know that, you know, that sacrifice by Washington, his army suffers in the ensuing campaign, especially at Brandywine in Germantown. Um, you know, he, he lacked that mobility that the riflemen provided to the Continental Army. You know, they didn't have the training and things, and, and he tried to make up for it and create a light infantry corps. But without Daniel Morgan, Things didn't go as Washington would have liked him to. So I, I think that's the most important thing there is, as remember, he's the commi- supreme commander of the Continental Forces. And he does a good job of not saying, well, this is, hey, I've got to worry about this um, and worrying about his own ego and stocking up when he, he knows he's cutting. The, and so he, he's taking troops that he could call down for, towards Philadelphia who are in the Hudson Highlands and things. He's ordering them up to join Schuyler and then Gates to fight against Burgoyne. So in many ways, Washington helped set the stage for the victory that ensued at Saratoga. Yeah, and certainly I think uh, despite the the uh, disappointments at, at Brandywine and at, and at Germantown, nonetheless, the fact that uh, Washington's army was pretty active at the time is cause for the British command structure to think, do they really want to be uh, putting all their eggs in one basket up and moving towards the support of, uh, of Burgoyne? And I think, you know, Burgoyne is is a early version of, of George McClellan in that he doesn't get all the support that he expected to get um, when he ran his campaign. And, <laughs> and, and lo and behold, he starts to move south. There's nobody there at Albany. There's nobody there to help him out. So so it, it certainly is a fascination. Um, uh, you know, the, there are other aspects to the campaign, which I know that you guys are going to cover and so forth. And so I'd like to uh, to move and look at some of the outlayers. But to do that first, I think it's important um, to uh, 
to identify who the key subordinates are in um, in Burgoyne's army and and uh, what are going to be their roles in this campaign. To um, you know, there's a large Hessian contingent. It, actually, it's called a German contingent because they're not all from H H the Hess area, Hess and they're under yeah. the command of Baron von Frederick von Redesel. Redesel. I've heard that name pronounced a lot of different ways. But Ray Dazel is a very capable officer, and he's going to be a stabilizing force in this army, a good influence. Um, his military professionalism and that of his subordinates is going to come into play in, at critical moments during the campaign. Um, I would call Ray Dazel the, the turtle, the slow but steady guy um, that's there when they need him in the campaign. The, the other key subordinate is going to be Simon, Major General Simon Fraser, and he's going to be in command of the other wing, which is primarily the British infantry. And they, they will um, fight. He'll lead the Battle of Hubberton, the pursuit of Arthur Sinclair's forces after the fall of Fort Ticonderoga. He'll be playing a lead role in the battles at Saratoga. Ultimately, though, he's going to be killed in the early part of the action at the second battle of Saratoga in October of 77 there. So it's capable. I would like to add though, to let people know, if you ask most people, they're gonna come to the conclusion that this is the British army, it's a professional army, and therefore it's must be, it's a significantly more experienced army. Well, the truth of the matter is, these forces had not seen much action at all. Um, I think Ray Dazel's men had seen some uh, a little bit, but most of these troops had come over and been brought over for this campaign. And they'd been in garrison in Ireland and other places and had literally no combat experience. A lot of the troops that Gates is gonna end up fighting the battle with at Saratoga, they fought at Boston. Some of them, they've, they've, they've fought at Bunker Hill, Lexington, Concord. Some of them have fought, uh, the officers and men have fought at Trenton, in Princeton, in the fighting at New York. So the Continental Army that was under Gates probably actually was more experienced in terms of recent combat experience there than the average soldier in Burgoyne's army. So it's there. Now, which army was more professionally trained? Which army was more better equipped in things? But, um, you know, Len, as a veteran, you know, you know, you, you, you can't discount that hands-on experience there. And um, that's, that's, you know, some, uh, some, it really fascinated me with the, um, with the campaign too. And, and, and I'm glad you raised that point because I think that you're in a, a situation in which, uh, Burgoyne is counting on a lot of indigenous people. He's counting on the Indians and so forth. And and I think the the big surprise for Burgoyne is that as he finds out that it's it's pretty difficult to control the Indians that are with him. And 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 that that I think deteriorates and de de detracts from his um, from the discipline of his force because he's got to stop them from doing things that they really wish to do and that are natural to them. And and it and, and I think it kind of just starts to split his force apart a little bit. And I, I think you're right on with that. I think that while the British army had a reputation, uh, the fact is, is that in so many instances, the British were counting on, uh, on, on loyalists and Tories and, and native peoples to augment their forces. And they were not as disciplined. And so consequently, Burgoyne has got in, interior problems he's got to deal with. Um, uh, you, you mentioned Hubberton and Bennington and uh, really interesting battlefields. You know, the Revolutionary War battlefields are not extraordinarily complex, but they do involve some um, uh, significant maneuvers and opportunities to, um, uh, to, to turn forces and things like that. Tell us about the, um, the battles of um, uh, Hubberton and Bennington and how they contributed to the outcome of Burgoyne's overall campaign. Well... Hubberton takes place right on the heels of the fall of Fort Ticonderoga. And um, St. Clair is moving his forces eastward over into Vermont. It's a rally in Castleton. 
and that's and the the rear guard is going to be held by Seth Warner, and he's got orders as they're moving east through the mountains of Vermont, to um, you know don't stop, keep moving, catch up with the main body of the army there. Well, they decide the men are tired. They've got enough, probably got enough space between them and the British, and they don't put out good security. They get around to Hubbardton, and sure enough, here comes Simon Fraser with 750 men and attacks. They put up a good fight. In the end, they get routed. In, 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 in the word that got spread out among the men, scatter and meet me in Castleton. And that's, that's how the Continentals left the field after their delaying action there. But um, again, so Burgoyne, you know, they're routed, but they do come back together. And Arthur Sinclair is able to get that force, come back southward, come down into Fort Edward. Um, it's not showing there on the map, but it's between Skeensboro. Out of the map's not up for that anymore. But anyway, he's able to get that force back in the action. Now, later on in, in, in August, early part of August, the supply crunch is hitting Burgoyne's army. And some of the troops, he also had, he had an extreme lack of horses and transportation. They had a whole Dragoon regiment, about 850 men, German Dragoons under the command of Colonel Baum. And Baum sent out into the countryside and he's given, you see, yeah, there, there's about 300 militia out there. And um, so he's going out, he's foraging, not finding too much, does find a, a few young bulls, a, a herd of them, and might have been better off just to take those and go back to the army than what ends up happening to him. Well, there's a guy over in New Hampshire, another one of the, you got, you got a lot of disgruntled guys, Brigadier General John Stark. He was, um, did a good job up around Boston, didn't get a promotion to general out of it. He went home um, and um, Stark's probably most famous. He's the marketing agent for the state of New Hampshire. Um, everyone knows the motto, live free or die. Well, that's his. And the actual full quote was, live free or die, death is not the worst of evils. So with this old curmudgeon, he gets promoted eventually as Brigadier General of the Militia. And he's going to get together about 1,800 to 2,000 men. And he's not sure that he's going to go cooperate with the Continental Army proper over in the Hudson Valley. But um, they send Brigadier General, Major General Benjamin Lincoln, another wing commander under Gates, or it's actually Schuyler at that time, um, who, who had worked with him in Boston and, and is able to convince him to be, play a supporting role in there. And his opportunity is going to come. They, there's word gets the bomb. And again, he's got these dragoons and they're out there looking for horses. And he hears that there's horses over in Bennington, Vermont, which is just over the modern border from state of New yep. York to Vermont. And so he starts heading in that direction to mount his dragoon force. Well, they get hit hard and they get routed there. Most of the men are killed and mostly captured there at Bennington. And it, it's a major victory for the Continental cause. Um, Stark and his men, it's a, it's a, it's a dire blow. Um, at the same time, a lot of the Indians that had been serving with um, Burgoyne, they are good. At, they're, they're leaving. One of the things that Burgoyne does in his leg of the campaign, he doesn't have tribes who knew that region from the Iroquois League or the Six Nations. He's got tribes from way out in Canada, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, you, you know, tribes that were the, they were actually mostly the French allies from the French and Indian War. And they're actually under the leadership of, of a guy named Charles Longley, who did some raids against British Indians in precursor to the French and Indian War. But these guys, the, the Native Americans that were under Burgoyne's command, they didn't even know this area. So he wasn't getting any benefit of, you know, the native tribes who could scout, point out, you know, passes through the woods, routes through the mountains and things like that. They did not know this area. 
Um, but what they, what, and, and Burgoyne failed to understand that these forces, their concept of warfare was different. It wasn't territorial. Um, it was a lot of times trophies. A lot of times trophies, you know, scalping. Um, proclamation to them and sat them down and basically told them we're not going to do that sort of thing. And so they just start drifting off slowly but surely. And by the time the main action comes around Saratoga, very few of them were around to be a supporting role. Sure. We're 10, you know, playing into that. So now, especially at Bennington, you see how far south he's come through and, you know, what's, what's he to do? He, he's got to keep coming at this point. But he does get some good news at that point. He, he learns that there is in the Hudson Highlands that um, General George Clinton has moved out with some of his troops. And he's at least making enough noise to prevent the Continental troops in that region from moving up to join the army at Saratoga or, or any more of those troops from that region from joining the army at Saratoga. Um, and that's going to be one of the key reasons why um, Burgoyne will actually hang on after his attempt to advance on September 19th at the first battle. Um, you know, he'll stay because he gets the, the, the night after or the next day in September, he learns that Clinton is supporting him in the Highlands. So he, he decides to stay and hold the line there on the Saratoga. Sure. Moving to the other side towards the West, um, uh, I remember one time taking a trip out uh, as part of this with uh, Jim Johnson and Ed Bars out to um, Fort Stanwix in the in the Mohawk Valley and uh, looking at Barry St. Leisure uh, in the in the fighting at Oriskany. Uh, could you comment briefly on that and, and its uh, relation to uh, Burgoyne's plans? Yeah. So they're coming in, you know, they're going to come up the Mohawk River and which which runs into the Hudson just just north of Albany. So they're supposed to be two, 3,000 men moving in there. Now, what's interesting about this, you know, you kind of get, yeah, we, we think of this as this is the Continentals versus the British regulars. Now, this, this is civil war going on. A lot of the troops, the infantry in St. Leger's army, they are New York loyalists, Tories, royalists, fighting against New York militia out there. That, that's mostly militia out there. Now, one of the reasons, St. Leger, he also has a thousand of the Iroquois there and, and they're on the home turf. So he's getting some advantage of that. And it's kind of going to be almost by ruse that St. Leger is going to give up this. Um, they, mostly the Indians and some of the um, Tory militia militia, they're going to outfight um, initially the Patriot militia at Oriskany and then they'll be under Nicholas Herkimer. There'll be a, a stand and they'll hold out and he'll send, you know, there's some, there's communications back and forth. Fort Stanwix is being besieged by St. Ledger. Now, a lot of the Indians had picked up and left there temporarily to go attack Herkimer at Oriskany, which was a supporting force coming up from the east. One of the things that they had pre-planned then was that when they left, Peter Gansvort, the colonel in charge at the fort, he launches a sortie out into the Indian encampments. And the Indians had left all of their supplies, everything they had accumulated, their bounties and captures in the camp while they went to fight at Oriskany. And they went all out and captured all of that. And, and that was a very demoralizing force. And um, St. Leger is going to lose hearts. The Indians are going to start coming back from Oriskany, and they're going to see that all their stuff has been captured, and they're all going to start scattering and leaving. And so St. Leger is just going to pull back, and the threat from the west in the Mohawk Valley is going to be ended there. And, of course, you had coming up right at, right at that there, had, had he not turned around, he would have been dealing with Benedict Arnold with a significant force that Schuyler had sent West to deal with him. You know? Sure. Comes back to Schuyler's. I, I think Schuyler's a guy who teed this campaign up for success for the Continentals. Here. 
That's a bold statement. Um, I, I'd like to ask you two more questions uh, to wrap up uh, tonight. Um, one of the men who really fascinates me, and I, I really, sadly, I don't think he gets nearly enough credit in history, is Daniel Morgan. And um, I'd like to um, get your sense of, of Morgan and his performance at Saratoga, and maybe a little before and a little after. Um, if you just take a few minutes to talk about him and his and his contributions to the to the revolution. Well, Morgan's a guy. He was born somewhere on the border between Pennsylvania and New Jersey, along the Delaware River. You know, both both states kind of claim him, and probably from New Jersey. But at a very young age, he has a falling out with his father, who had remarried after his mother died with a younger woman. And he heads south, like a lot of people from that region, following the natural migration pattern down of Pennsylvanians into the Shenandoah Valley in the Winchester and Berryville area. And he makes a go of it as a wagoneer. In fact, that's, that's his name, is the old wagoneer by the time he's commanding troops during the American Revolution. Um, his, his first service in the military came during the French and Indian War, where he was kind of a teamster. Um, he would be involved in some skirmishes here and there, but by and large, he was a teamster. Um, he comes to hate the British. He um, was disrespectful to an officer in some fashion, and he was given a hundred lashes, a traditional British punishment. And um, he would later use that he, as when he would be talking to his men and rallying his men. He, he took pride in the fact, he said, I counted every one of them. And I can tell you, they only gave me 99 and they still owe me one. And, <laughs> that, that, and, you know, he, and, and like before the Battle of the Cowpens, the men recalled how then he'd pull up his coat and his shirt and he'd show them the scars on his back from the strapping that he had received for his discipline there. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, you know, he puts this core of rifleman co company, he comes up with two companies, end up going under his command at Boston doing a good job there. I mentioned that earlier. But then in 17, late 1775, he's going to be part of that American invasion of Canada. That's another thing people, it's like, wow, 1775, we're invading Canada. Yeah, late. And Morgan, you know, it, it's kind of a botched thing. Benedict Arnold's there and nothing really doesn't come off to be too well-coordinated forces coming from two different directions. But Morgan and his command, they managed to breach the defensive. And, you, you know, the only thing I was sitting there reading about this, it's, it, it, they're, they're just running through the narrow streets of Quebec, trying to evade large French forces, overrunning some force there before finally, you know, they're just overwhelmed there and captured. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of something I visualize, like Han Solo and Luke Skywalker going through the Death Star type of thing, just trying to get the heck out of there. But He's going to be held prisoner there, and then he's going to come back in Washington's army, be promoted to colonel, um, and, um, you know, it, it be placed in command of the Corps of Sharpshooters. And ultimately, he's, he's going to be on hand for two of the most critical victories. Um, at Saratoga, it's going to be his troops, and they're going to be used very uniquely. You know, they have these long rifles that are taller than the average man at the time, but they were rifles. They weren't the brown vests um, or the Charville muskets that the typical infantryman was carrying them. It was rifles and it took longer to load, which would make them vulnerable. But what they're doing in, in the army is they have a core, you know, battalion of light infantry under the command of Colonel Henry Dearborn. New, these are New Hampshire Continentals. And they're there, and, and, and remember the rifles that Morgan's men have, they don't take a bayonet. So in the, in the long amount of time that it takes them to reload, if they don't have the immediate support of the light infantry there, the British can easily charge them. So Dearborn and Morgan really work together as a good team at Saratoga. Um, first in holding the continental left flank at the first battle, and then going out on the offensive and being some of the key forces um, in that final push in Morgan with um, Benedict Arnold at the second battle. Of course, he goes on. Um, again, Morgan's another guy. 
it seems that when he doesn't get his promotion after this, he's got back problems and he resigns and goes back to Winchester ultimately. Um, Morgan's also close to Gates. I think that's something people don't, they live near each other after the war out in the Valley. And he's going to come out, um, you, you know, so he's, he's with Gates there. He's not going to come out of retirement until late 1780. And he's briefly going to take over and win the Battle of Cowpens in South Carolina. Um, which, so he's on two of the biggest victories. Um, in Saratoga, to me, and if someone wants to, why would, why, what's the one reason why I want to go on this tour? You want to know about Saratoga because Saratoga is the decisive battle of the war. It earns international respect and brings French military assistance to the continental cause. Without that French military assistance and the funding and the equipment and the training that it brings to Washington and the Continental and the French Navy, it's hard to see the war ending in the same fashion that it did. So that's critical there. Well, you know, it's it, it's always nice when a when a uh, interview just dovetails and does exactly what it's supposed to do. And and you anticipated my last question. Uh, and so, so I don't need to ask it, but what I would <laughs> like to do is, uh, is, um, give you an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, just tell, tell us why and what, what is the most special spot you think, uh, on the, on the Saratoga battlefield that, uh, we're going to see that, uh, really, really touches you and, and makes it work for you. Well, I'll tell you about it too. From the first one I talked about earlier, standing there on the bluff and looking out over the Hudson Valley in the morning there and a little bit of clouds hanging over the mountains to the east in New York and Vermont and the sun coming up there. Scenic beauty, that boy, that's really impressive. Um, then there's another spot. When you're at that um, final redoubt there, the Bremen redoubt on the British western right. flank, where the final successful continental assaults are going to be launched. Yes. Yeah. You get a great view shed there and looking across that land and seeing the hills that the continentals formed behind and came up to launch this. Um, it really gives you a great tactical perspective. And, and, and to think, you know, some of the, the consequences of what I just mentioned a few, couple minutes ago, that's where they came to fruition. You know, the sacrifices of those men right there. Um, but I will say, you know, that this whole thing, man, it's it, it's breathtaking, too, to stand on the ramparts of Fort Ticonderoga there and look out onto the lake there, you know, and, you know. Well, the one thing I do know, and, and, and I could talk to you for you and Gary for hours. Um, uh, sorry that Gary can't join us with this, because I, I know that uh, having been with you guys multiple times, you guys really uh, make things happen in a, in a, in a special kind of way. And I rarely see anybody that is as well prepared, um, as you guys are. And so, uh, with that, um, let us adjourn this and hopefully until, uh, the first part of June, uh, when we'll, when we'll meet again in Lake George, New York and, and have the opportunity to, uh, to make this happen. Scott, right. thank you for a really great thank interview. Thank you, Len. And, uh, yeah, sure. We'll be in touch soon. You take care and, and my sympathies with, with you there. Thank, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yes. And uh, look for the invitations for the next program in uh, just a day or two. And you can see this interview again on uh, Friday or Saturday. Thank you all and good night.